So today uh, we will be talking about colorectal cancer and some advances in screening and prevention as you guys enjoy a nice dinner. <laughs> I hope some of the videos that I will show of the colons, uh, by the time we get there I think everybody should be done from eating. So. Uh, this talk has several objectives. First, I would like for you to understand a little bit about colon cancer which I will refer to in this talk as colorectal cancer or CRC. Understand something about its incidence, mortality, and some of the risk factors for colorectal cancer. And then we want to talk about why do we need to screen for colorectal cancer and why is that important. Next we will talk about some modes, uh, different ways to screen for colorectal cancer. And then finally, we'll talk about some advances in polyp detection and resection here at Archbold. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So a little bit about colon cancer. Before, let's talk about the colon briefly itself. The colon is also referred to as the large intestines. And its job is to remove water, electrolytes, and some nutrients from your food and then to store and help eliminate the stools. Colorectal cancer is an out of control growth of cells in the colon. It is the third most common cancer worldwide and also in the United States. And it is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. So it's a very important very common cancer and that's why we're talking about it today. Yearly the incidence of colorectal cancer which is the number of new patients who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer each year in the United States is 132,000. So each year 132,000 Americans are diagnosed with colorectal cancer. So what are some of the risk factors for colorectal cancer. Like everything else, it has to do with nature and nurture. So we'll start with the genetic part. So some of the most common factors that can cause uh, colorectal cancer are genetic factors. And here's a table of some of the conditions that can uh, predispose somebody to colorectal cancer. So, for example, familial adenomatous polyposis. And if you don't know these names, then you don't have to worry. You probably don't have those, okay? <laughs> uh, familial adenomatous polyposis is a condition where people get hundreds of polyps in the colon, and they start at a very young age, like in the teenage years. And those people, virtually 100% of them, will have colon cancer unless treated by uh, removing the colon. Another more, more common condition is called Lynch syndrome in which patients are predisposed to colorectal cancer but they don't necessarily have hundreds of polyps like the first condition. And those patients are also at risk for endometrial cancer, cancer of the ureters, kidney, and the small intestines as well. Other more common uh, genetic factors uh, are if somebody in your family has a family history of polyps or colorectal cancer. So if you have a first degree relative who has polyps or colorectal cancer, that there is an increase in the incidence of colorectal cancer by six times compared to somebody who does not have that family history. If the patient has a history of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, again this predisposes the patient to having colorectal cancer. And lastly, ethnicity is also important. We know from many studies that African Americans are more likely to have colon cancer compared to their white counterparts. So those are some of the genetic factors that can contribute to colorectal cancer. Having said this, most cases of patients who have colorectal cancer do not have any of these conditions and do not have family history of colorectal cancer. This is just, this is what the studies have shown. When we looked at cohorts of patients who are African American and non-African American or mostly white, 
African American have an increased chance of getting colorectal cancer when controlling for people who are white of the same age, the same gender, and smoking status, and body weight, and et cetera. One more question. Yeah. What? So the reason I put this under genetic is because there are genetic components that we don't, we don't yet know what these genes are that seem to contribute colorectal cancer, making it more prevalent in the African Americans compared to the non-African Americans. There might be also some dietary uh, factors. We don't understand why this is the case, but we know it is the case. And so uh, people who are African American need to know this so that they can be proactive in getting screened at a younger age to prevent this from happening. So let's talk about some of the uh, non-genetic factors. And those are some of the factors that can, again, increase your chance of getting colorectal cancer is abdominal radiation. This is commonly in people who've had other kinds of cancer or who work in radiation departments a long time ago where they did not have a lot of protective mechanisms. Those patients can be predisposed to colorectal cancer. Patients who've had transplants, especially kidney transplant, as part of having transplantation, you are put on immunosuppressive medications that suppress your immune system. And your immune system fights cancer cells. So when your immune system is down, you are less likely to fight cancer cells and more, you are more likely to get cancer. And so renal transplant patients have to be screened more frequently than the normal population. <coughs> Diabetes has also been shown a risk, to be a risk factor for this disease, as well as drinking alcohol, obesity, and smoking. And you could say alcohol, obesity, and smoking, and more or less diabetes are risk factor for a lot of cancers, uh, mechanisms we don't quite understand, uh, but they are linked to many cancers, especially also colorectal cancer. So the next question is, why do we need to screen for colorectal cancer? We talked about what is colorectal cancer. We talked about some of the risk factors for colorectal cancer. Now, why should we screen for it? Well, the simple answer is this. Colorectal cancer can be prevented, okay? So we know from this diagram that a normal colon will look something like this, okay? Healthy, uh, smooth lining, which is called the mucosa. And then over time, there are genetic mutations that uh, go in your colon. And then you get something called an adenoma, which looks like this under the microscope and looks like this and endoscopy. So those polyps are the precursors for what then becomes cancer, okay? And so the role of the colonoscopy is to try to intervene here and prevent those polyps from becoming cancers by finding these polyps and removing these polyps early before they have had time to form into cancer. Traditionally, it has been thought that this process takes about 10 years by the time you get a mutation, to have an adenoma or a polyp and then to develop a cancer, it's been thought to take 10 years. But more and more studies are showing that are, there are different kinds of polyps and that not all polyps are the same and some polyps could develop into cancer within three years, not 10 years. Okay? So that's why we need to screen for colon cancer because it is a disease that can be prevented by finding polyps and removing polyps. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the evidence there is to screen for colonoscopy. This is a study that was done by Dr. Zauber and his colleagues, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The New England Journal of Medicine is one of the uh, most important journals in uh, the field of medicine, and it is very well respected, and it's very difficult to get, get a study published there. So anything that is published in that journal is very highly respected. And this study was done in 2012. And what they did is they looked at uh, the general population and looked at the risk of getting colon cancer in a cohort of patients and looked at the risk of dying from, co from colon cancer. So in this specific cohort of patients, the risk of dying if you did not have a colonoscopy, there was 25 deaths 
from colon cancer among patients who did not get a colonoscopy, okay? For people who did have a colonoscopy over the same amount of period of time, there was only 12 deaths. So the death from colon cancer was not zero if you had a colonoscopy, but it went down from 25 to 12 deaths. So a drop by 50% in the chance of dying from colon cancer if you had a colonoscopy and polyps were found and removed. So that's one of the studies. I'll share with you an earlier study from 1993, which looked at 1,419 patients who had a screening colonoscopy. And it found that the incidence of colorectal cancer, this is now not death from colon cancer. The first study that I showed you was about the number of people who died from colon cancer. This is about the risk of finding colon cancer. And the risk of colorectal cancer was decreased by up to 90% among patients who had a colonoscopy in this, in this line here compared to people who did not have a colonoscopy. So if you had a colonoscopy, a screening colonoscopy, an average risk patient, the risk of dying from cancer, I'm sorry, the risk of developing colon cancer was decreased by up to 90%. Now there are a lot of studies that show similar results. I just showed you two of the ones that would convey the message that colonoscopy works. I did a study myself looking at the difference between sigmoidoscopy versus a colonoscopy. Sigmoidoscopy was, is where you look at the first part of the colon and colonoscopy you look at the whole colon. And in this study, which I, I published in 2012, I looked at uh, 2,400 patients who were screened, average risk patients who had a screening colonoscopy at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Of those, almost half of them had polyps. 912 patients had polyps, and there were more than 3,000 polyps that were removed. And I found that 42% of all patients who had polyps had polyps on the right side, meaning if you had just a sigmoidoscopy and looked at the left side of the colon, you would actually miss uh, those patients. 42% of them had polyps on the right side. And therefore, based on this study as well as other studies, I think that a colonoscopy is the best test to have. So what other modes of screening are there? We talked a little bit about colonoscopy. There are stool testing. We talked about the sigmoidoscopy, the colonoscopy, and there is also a CT scan to list only a few of the possible tests. Let me talk about them a little bit more. So a stool, there are different stool tests that can be done to screen for colon cancer. And basically most of those tests are looking for blood in the stool, okay? And they are relatively cheap to be done and most of them you get a kit and you do it at home. Some of you might have had this. The problem with those is that they have a poor specificity. That means that if you have a positive test, that really doesn't tell us much. If you're on aspirin, this test can be positive. If you ate meat that day, that test can be positive. There are about 10 or 20 different things for reasons for this test to be positive other than colon cancer. Additionally, this test is only meant to look for cancers and it does not detect polyps. So if you have polyps, you are not going to test positive most of the time. But if you have cancer, you might test positive. So in countries where uh, colonoscopies are very expensive and are not covered by insurance, this might be a good initial test to start with. And then if somebody tests positive, they would still need a colonoscopy. However, this also can be good here if you are really scared of a colonoscopy or if you had a bad experience with a colonoscopy. You can get this test done once a year and if it's negative, you can be reasonably assured that you probably do not have colon cancer, okay? But if it is positive, then you will need to have a colonoscopy. The second test which I talked about is the flexible sigmoidoscopy. It's like a colonoscopy except we don't go all the way around the colon, we just check the left side of the colon. It's a little bit more expensive. It is a little bit easier than doing a colonoscopy because we're not going that far into the colon. However, I just showed you the data and there's other data there that anything on the right side you miss. We're not going into the right side, so 
uh, we don't know what's there. And if there are polyps there that could develop cancer, you're going to miss them if you have this test alone. The colonoscopy, we check all of the colon. It is more expensive than a stool test. It is more expensive than a flexible sigmoidoscopy. However, it is the gold standard test for screening for colorectal cancer. It is an invasive test. You will have to come into uh, the hospital or the surgical center. You will have to be sedated. You will miss work during that day. So it has some disadvantages in that regard. The last one that I want to tell you about is a CT colonography, which is a CT scan or a CAT scan that you can do. You will still have to take the prep. You will still have to drink that nasty stuff that nobody likes and clean your colon and then come uh, to the radiology department and have a CAT scan to look for polyps. It is as expensive as a colonoscopy. However, it is not invasive. We're not putting any tubes from below. So if you don't like that, you could possibly consider this test. If they find any problems on this test, you will still need to have a colonoscopy. This is only a CAT scan. They cannot remove polyps using this. This test is not available at Archibald. Here are some pictures of some of the stool tests. The most common one is called the fecal occult blood test, which looks for blood. This new test is called the FIT test. Looks for some genetic mutations, and it's supposed to be a better test. The cost is similar for both tests. Again, colonoscopy, I've been talking about it. It's the gold standard test. With a colonoscopy, our goal is to get through the rectum, go into this area, which is called the sigmoid colon, into the descending colon, transverse colon, ascending colon, and then to the cecum. The cecum is where your small intestines connect to the large intestines. The scope that you see here has a, an instrument channel through which we can put things to cut polyps out or remove things. There is obviously a video camera, a light source, and an irrigation area where we can use uh, water to clean the colon if you didn't do your job at home. Um, this is a video of a, of, that, of a screening colonoscopy that we did here uh, last week. Just to show, this was uh, mostly a normal colonoscopy. So here uh, we are going in, in, uh, up through the colon from the rectum. As you see, the, the colon mucosa looks normal. Our goal on going in is mostly to get to the cecum, which is the beginning part of the colon, which I have got to right here. We see a little bit of uh, bubbles, which is normal, some uh, liquid stools. This is mostly a clean area, but I, I use some water, as you can see here, to clean the area a little bit more. We can use that instrument uh, channel to suction. We identify the uh, opening for the appendix, which is right here. And that tells us that we have made it all the way to where I want it to go. We get to that point in about 96% of the time. Here I get into the small intestines. It's called the terminal ileum. Again, verify we're in the right location. Then we start taking a look. At this point, it's just cleaning, suctioning, uh, taking a look, going in, going out doing the best I can to try to find what's going on. Here I find a small area of abnormal mucosa right there. So I'm using the forceps here to try to get to this uh, small area here. This is not a polyp. I will show you what a polyp looks like. We take that out. See a little bit of bleeding. Of course, ev everything is magnified here. Now we're just coming out. This is again the ascending part of the colon and that part down here is the cecum. We're just cleaning. As you can see, the colon has a lot of folds. Uh, things can hide behind these folds. And so I'm just going in, going out, trying to take a look, uh, look behind the folds, see if there is anything that needs to come out. See if any polyps are hiding. They like to do so. We tend to miss more polyps on the right side of the colon. So I like to spend more time on the right side of the colon than the left side. More studies have shown that uh, col uh, gastroenterologists can miss polyps on this side of the colon more than the other side. So again, we're just taking a look. Of course, this is an edited uh, video, so 
I've cut most of the exam. I get to this area which doesn't want to open up very easily, so I'm going in and out. There is a, some muscle contractions in the colon, so I'm trying to release that muscle contraction so I can take a really good look. As you can see, this area is not opening like I want it to. So I'm going in, going out, inflating air, suctioning air, just trying to get that area to relax for me to get the best uh, inspection of that area. This is what you want your colon to look like if you have a colonoscopy. Little bit of stool, but not much. Here I'm looking at the rectum with the scope retroflex on itself, looking backwards. We can look at the area where the rectum is, make sure there are no cancers there. Sometimes cancers can hide in that area. And in a normal view, I cannot see them. So we do this retroflex view to take a look at it. So this is what a normal colonoscopy would look like. The CT scan that I was telling you about would look like something like this. There is a CAT scan, and there is a 3D representation of what a polyp might look like on a CAT scan. If they find this, then you will have to have a colonoscopy. Now, coming to the question that you had, sir, when do you need uh, to start screening for colorectal cancer? And the answer is, it depends. The first, if you are an average patient, you don't have family history of colon cancer, uh, you just need to start screening at age 50, and then you get it every 10 years. If you are an African American, then you need to start uh, screening at 45, so five years before whites and non-African Americans. You start at 45, and again get it every 10 years. If you have a first degree uh, relative who has colorectal cancer or has polyps that are called adenomas, those are the polyps that can become colon cancer, or if you have two or more first degree relatives at any age who has polyps or colorectal cancer, then you start screening at age 40 or 10 years before the youngest uh, case. So let's say your mother had colon cancer at age 45 or colon polyps, then you would start screening 10 years before. And the reason we choose 10 years, like I told you, we think that it takes about 10 years for adenomas to develop and then become cancer. So we want to catch them before they become cancer, so we start 10 years before. So you would start at 35 if you had a family history of somebody at age 45, okay? If you had a first degree relative with colon cancer or polyps who is older than 60, or if you had two second degree relatives, then you start at 40 and screen every 10 years, okay? So if your mom had it at age 70, then you still start at age 40, but then you get it every 10 years, not every five years. If you have two second degree family relatives, the same thing, you start at age 40. In patients who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, usually we start screening them eight years after the disease was diagnosed, and then we screen them every one to two years. Again, they are more likely to develop colon cancers, and we need to be aggressive in preventing that. Uh, can I ask a question? I had Crohn's disease, but I also had a bone marrow transplant. I had leukemia, and my sister was a donor, and she didn't have Crohn's disease, and the Crohn's was cured. So how often now should I have a colon I think I have about every five, five years. But. Where was your Crohn's? What's, where was the Crohn's? Was it in the small intestines? Right there at the small and the large. In the small intestines? Okay. We would recommend that you probably should have a, a colonoscopy every two years. Every two years? Right. Now, this is the initial screening. So let's say you go in and you had the negative colonoscopy. Oh, meaning I, that... I had 15 inches removed, too. That area, a little bit of the small and right. part of the colon. Right. Uh, because the Crohn's was so advanced, they had to reduce surgery. Yeah, which, which happens commonly. So I would, I would, for you, get screening every two years, even though your Crohn's has uh, been in remission. Yep. People who have Lynch syndrome, which is that syndrome of uh, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, family history of endometrial cancer, they start screening at age 20, and they get screening every year. If you have Lynch syndrome, you need to be screened every year. If you wait two years, sometimes I've seen patients who've waited two years and got colon cancer in the meantime. If you have this familial adenomatous polyposis that I was talking about, then you start at age 10 years old. 
and you get screened yearly. And if they find polyps on colonoscopy, which is the most common finding and is most relevant to patients. So if you have polyps on colonoscopy, when do you need another colonoscopy? And again, the question is it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on the size of the polyp and you know, how big was the polyp, how many polyps did they find, what kind of polyps were they, were they the kind of polyps that has a very high risk of developing cancer, were they the kind of polyp that is intermediate risk of developing cancer, were they the kind of polyps that do not cause you to have cancer. And then also depends on the method of resection. How did they take out your polyps? Did they come out in one piece? Did they take them out in, in several pieces? So all these are complex factors. You should listen to what your gastroenterologist or endoscopist says, and depending on how many polyps and the size and the location and the method of resection, you can have another colonoscopy in three months, six months, one year, three years, five years, seven years, or 10 years. So it all depends. We don't have time to go all over that tonight, and that's why um, we went to school for so long is so that we know these answers and we can help you. <laughs> Lastly, I want to talk about some advances in, in the imaging to, for screening colonoscopies. I did a study about this a few years ago. And one way to look at the colon in a different, in, in a different way than just looking with the white light that I just showed you is called chromoendoscopy. In this, we are applying a vital dye like indigo carmine or methylene blue and we're just spraying it inside the colon and what this does it enhances the mucosal patterns during a colonoscopy and this is most helpful in patients with inflammatory bowel disease because it can be time consuming to do this is a picture that was taken from one of uh, my colleagues and this here is a, a picture of what is a, a polyp that was seen with just regular white light, which is the kind of colonoscopy I just showed you, okay? Now, this area for somebody who's not experienced, even a gastroenterologist, might look normal. However, this patient had a history of Crohn's disease, and so the doctor was using this chromoendoscopy. So once they sprayed that dye that I'm telling you about, this, air, this is the same area, and you can see that this is not normal. This is actually a large, flat polyp that needs to come out and uh, can be a very high risk for cancer. So this is where chromoendoscopy can be helpful. Currently, it's not recommended to have chromoendoscopy unless you have uh, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. This is a test that is available here, and we can do that. Uh, we have not done that yet here, but I've done that many times at Mayo Clinic. Virtual chromoendoscopy is where you use light filters in the scope in order to improve visualizations without having to spray anything. And it can help differentiate the different kind of polyps. It can help tell us the polyps that are hyperplastic, which are the polyps that do not become cancer, from the polyps that are dysplastic, which are the kind of polyps that can, have, that can become cancer. And all you have to do for that is click on the button during the colonoscopy and the light changes and it looks different and it can help you see uh, what the polyp looks like. I do that frequently in the endoscopy lab here in the hospital and at the ambulatory care center. If I'm looking at the polyp or if, if there is an area that looks suspicious, I will click on that uh, button, take a better look at it and it can help me better see if there is something and if there is something to better tell what it is. So I use that frequently. Last, I want to tell you about something that we do not have, avail uh, have available here, but it is very, I think it's a very neat advancement. It's called confocal laser endomicroscopy. And what this does is magnifies the colonic mucosa a thousand times. Normal colonoscopy, it's about 20 times. This magnifies it a thousand times. So you are looking at the cells. You're not looking at the colon anymore. You are looking at the cells like using a microscope. And it has a very high accuracy of predicting if a polyp uh, or an area is normal or abnormal. You get imaging that look like this. With this area is what, what normal colon mucosa should look nice, uh, should look like nice and regular. This is what an adenoma looks like. It's starting to look thick and irregular. And this is what a cancer looks like. 
uh, kind of looks ugly. Okay. Lastly, I want to talk to you about something that we have available here. It's called endoscopic mucosal resection. It is a new method to remove larger polyps in the colon. We can remove polyps up to 10, even 15 centimeters big. Uh, um, so those are very large polyps that normally patients would need to have a colonoscopy for. However, we can do those polyps here and we can take them out without needing surgery. Those are polyps, not cancer. If somebody has cancer, this doesn't work for them. Cancer needs surgery, chemo, and radiation. Polyps, we can take out. It is done as an outpatient procedure. So you come in, get it done, and go home just like a colonoscopy. It has risks for complications, but it is low. 1% uh, risk for a break in the lining of the colon. 5% risk of having some bleeding after the colonoscopy. And it has high chances of success. And of course, it is now available here. I'll show you this video of a polyp that we removed in the cecum using this technique. So here we are in the cecum and we come across this uh, polyp here that looks like uh, it, it is not cancer, but if left maybe for a, month, uh, a few months to a year will become cancer. I'm using a needle to inject in the plane underneath the lining of the mucosa, the, the lining of the colon. We're injecting that plane, lifting the polyp up so that we can cut it without cutting the wall of the colon. So I just go all around the polyp. I inject around it with this special dye that I have and then epinephrine, which helps prevent bleeding. Then we're using a snare to cut this out. So most of the time, if it is small enough, I try to, to get it in one piece. A lot of times it has to come in, in several pieces. So this is one piece. We get the snare all around it. Make sure we have a good cushion. We're applying cautery now. And then we're cutting that area. Okay, so now it's cut. Uh, we're cleaning the area inspecting the defect make sure there is no break as we can see it all looks blue so blue is true meaning it's good and uh, so that's good we burn the area make sure all the edges are burned sometimes we do that sometimes we don't now we're going to use some clips to uh, close this defect and help it uh, heal so those are what the clips look like this will heal on its own, but the clips have been shown to help prevent bleeding that can happen up to a month uh, after this had been done. So uh, we're putting two clips here, the, the first one, here comes the second one. The area looks good, it's closed, now we're, we need to get that polyp, so we use this net here, go fishing for it, we get it out, and then we take it out. And then we put it, uh, here is the polyp outside. Sometimes we pin it, most of the times we haven't done that. And then we just send it to the pathologist, we're just taking a picture of what it looks like. And it shows a tubular villus adenoma. So this is the kind of adenoma that if left in place, of course, will become cancer. Those clips, stay those clips usually stay about a month. Sometimes they have gone in a year later and the clips were still there, but they don't cause anything. You might beep if you go to the airport though. No, no. No, they stay there. They can stay there for years. They don't, they're people, I mean, you wouldn't know if you, that you had clips unless somebody told you. And then if you need to get an MRI, you know, that might be a problem. Most of the time they come out on their own. So some final notes. Colonoscopy, as you have seen, I've shown, I've shown you what a colonoscopy looks like. It is not a perfect test. The colon has a lot of turns, a lot of folds. It's difficult to get through. Sometimes it takes us an hour, sometimes an hour and a half to do it. Sometimes it takes 15, 20 minutes. Everybody is different. But the bottom line is it's not a perfect test. So if you get a colonoscopy, that does not guarantee that you're not going to have colon cancer. You could have a normal colonoscopy and still have cancer within two or three years. And this has been reported in many studies and many literatures. However, 
like I've shown you, the chances of you getting colorectal cancer, if you have a screening colonoscopy, <laughs> drops by about a half or more. So it's not a perfect test, but it's the best test we have so far. We continue to work to try to make this test better and better. The prep is the most important part of this examination. Everybody will tell you this was the hardest part, is to take that nasty gallon of stuff, and is there anything else that we can take, and can I take something smaller, and makes me gag. We have some different preparations which we have used. However, all the studies have showed that that big gallon of Go Lightly is probably the best prep. I've tasted it myself. I've tasted it myself just to see what it, it tastes like. And it, it doesn't really taste bad. I know some people think it tastes horrible. I didn't think it tasted bad. But it's just that you have to drink a lot of it in a short period of time. What I tell patients, if you have problems while you're drinking it, just take it slowly. You're supposed to drink it every 10 minutes. Nothing is going to happen if you wait 15 or 20 minutes. As long as you finish it before the time I see you, I'm okay with it, okay? <laughs> colonoscopy can save lives, okay? I cannot stress this enough. If you get a colonoscopy, I've seen a lot of patients who, if we did not do a colonoscopy, would have had cancer, and we saved their lives by doing a colonoscopy. So get your screening if you haven't done so. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Besides doing this, I like to do research. Here is my, uh, one of my posters in the national meeting. I looked at the factors for low colorectal cancer screening in an ethnically diverse and a minority population in Palestine, which is where I was born, in Bethlehem, and where I grew up. And I still like to do research, and I enjoy that very much. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Earlier, you mentioned that um, the, that you could see the appendix. If the appendix is removed, does that affect the colon? No, it doesn't. Um, it's just a marker that we have gotten to that part called the cecum. And if we get to the cecum, then we know we're doing a full colonoscopy. So it's something that we document that we got to. If the cecum is, uh, uh, if the appendix is removed, Sometimes we will see the scar that is left there. Sometimes we will not see it. We have to depend on other uh, uh, landmarks that we got to that area. One of them is getting to that small intestine. So if we get into the small intestines like I showed you, then we know that we have reached the cecum because that opening is right there in the cecum. So you don't necessarily have to see it. And if you had an appendectomy, it does not affect your colonoscopy. How effective is a barium enema colonoscopy? So that's one test I have not mentioned here for the uh, sake of time. It, just like a CT scan, it, it helps us take a look inside the colon. If there is anything big, we can see it on a barium. Anything small, if it's less than a centimeter, half a centimeter, a quarter of an inch, you probably are not going to see it. In that study at Mayo Clinic, I did not share all the data, of course, but we found that some polyps, even though they are very, very small, even a quarter of an inch can still have cancer in them. So it's a study that we can do. If you cannot have a colonoscopy for whatever reason, then it's, it's better than having nothing, but it does not compare well compared to a colonoscopy. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. What are some of the early symptoms of CRC? So as I have shown you, colon cancer can be very tricky. By the time you get symptoms, a lot of times it has become big enough. So if it starts bleeding, if you start seeing blood in the stool or a black stool, then that is an indication that something is wrong and you should not wait. You should come and see somebody immediately and you need to be tested. If you're getting, if you have changes in your bowel habits, you're uh, suddenly constipated, your stool looks different, it's thinner than it used to, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to come out. Anything like that is also an indication that something is going on. It doesn't have to be cancer, but it can be, can, can be a sign of cancer. So change in stool habits, uh, bleeding, uh, obstruction, which is where you're not passing gas, you're not passing stool. That's another indication that something is going on. So those are some of the signs. However, as I showed you, the colon lumen is quite big. And for you to have that, the polyp or the cancer will have to be advanced before something like this happens. Another symptom is abdominal pain. If you started having some unusual abdominal pain, 
then you need to get tested. Having said this, everything that I just told you now can happen with a lot of other stuff. So if you have any of those symptoms, don't be alarmed. Most likely you do not have colon cancer. They are sort of in the same family because they're both autoimmune kind of disease. So autoimmune diseases are diseases in which your body does not recognize itself and is, sends cells to fight uh, your own cells, okay? So you have inflammation because your body is attacking your intestines. So that's how they are similar. They are different, however, because celiac disease is from gluten sensitivity. It's related to somebody eating gluten, which is found in wheat and rye, and then you get an allergic reaction, and then you have this inflammation and autoimmune attack, okay? Whereas Crohn's disease is not related to anything like, like gluten sensitivity. We don't know why people get Crohn's disease. Celiac disease mostly affects the small intestines in the upper part of your small intestines, like from above, uh, Crohn's disease, like this gentleman here, most of the time affects the last part of your small intestines called the terminal ileum. And sometimes, of course, it affects your colon. It can happen anywhere, but most of the time that's where it happens. Celiac disease, you, most patients recover if they just stop eating gluten and go on a gluten-free diet. Uh, Crohn's disease, you will need to be on medication. Some of them are very... Uh, expensive and uh, have serious side effects, but you will need to be treated. And most of the time, it doesn't go away uh, on its own. What's the difference between diverticulitis and Crohn's disease? Diverticulitis is the um, about 40 percent of Americans have pouches in the colon that are called diverticuli, which is just a weakness in the lining of the colon and it causes a pouch to come out from the colon into the, into the uh, abdomen, okay? And those are, because like I said, about 40% of people have them, so most people have no problems with them. However, in some people, the, this lining can break up and you can have stools that can cause a local inflammation and people will present with abdominal pain and fever that's called diverticulitis. This will need to be treated with antibiotics, and if you have several of those episodes, you might need to have that part of the colon taken out, because sometimes it can be serious. The other thing that can happen with divertic diverticuli is that they can bleed. That weakness that happens there happens right where the blood vessels go into the lumen of the, um, of the wall of the colon, and a lot of times those blood vessels can be exposed and they can bleed. And those patients usually will present with painless bleeding. So if somebody just says, you know, I'm, I'm just having uh, bright red blood when I go to the commode, but I feel fine, I have no pain, I have no symptoms. And those are most commonly related to diverticular bleeding. We can do a colonoscopy for that, try to find what the bleeding diverticula is, and uh, try to burn it or clip it like I just showed you and treat it that way. If that doesn't happen, sometimes that part of the colon will have to come out. Yes, sir. Does a high uh, fiber diet help with um, <coughs> preventing polyps in the... All right, so there, is, uh, there are other risk factors for colon cancer, which I have not talked about. Some of them are eating a low fiber diet is a risk factor for colon cancer. Eating uh, a diet full of red meats is also a risk factor for colon cancer. So eating a high fiber diet is supposed to help prevent this from happening. Other protective factors, there have been some studies that showed that aspirin uh, can, be, uh, can prevent in some patients, not every patient, can help protect from colon cancer. So certainly we recommend people to eat a healthy diet, high fibers uh, for patients who can tolerate it. Some patients cannot tolerate the high fiber diet. Fibers do not get digested and they come out in the stool, they help help with having a good bowel movement, but in some patients, they can cause a lot of bloating and gas. So if you have a lot of bloating and gas as, as one of the problems, then you should not go on a high fiber diet because you will probably feel miserable. Other questions? 
die that you put in. Did yeah. you make that decision when you got in there and saw that, or was that part of your normal procedure? Which die? You mean to inject? The inject the die right. around the polyp. Right. So polyp. Right, yeah. Under the polyp. So I use, uh, I use that dye very frequently. Some gastroenterologists don't. Okay. The reason I like it is because once I cut that polyp like I showed you, if it looks blue, then I know there is no perforation. I did not get to the muscles and everything is good. If you do not use that dye and you just use normal saline, which is just, uh, you know, just a liquid that looks like water and it has some salt in it, then you cannot tell 100% if there, this cut was too deep or not. So for bigger polyps, like the ones I showed you, that's what I use. I start, you know, if it looks about a centimeter or more, like uh, half an inch or more, I use that dye, but you don't necessarily have to. Excuse me, people who do this EMR use this dye. If you have to do, remove big polyps, we use the dye all the time. You mentioned a, a more advanced test, a confocal laser. Laser under microscopy. Yeah. yeah. Is that something that the hospital is investigating? Or? Here? No, this is, um, this was available at Mayo Clinic where I trained and that's what I used. The places where it's helpful is, is there is a lot of debate. You may have read this, it came out six months ago, that colonoscopy is very expensive. This was all over the news that Medicare pays a lot of money for having screening colonoscopies. And part of the expenses of colonoscopy is removing these polyps, okay? Each jar that I sent uh, to the pathologist costs about 100 to $200 for the pathologist to look at those polyps, okay? So there has been a move to try to see if the gastroenterologist can tell, just using images like this, if the polyp is dysplastic or if the polyp is hyperplastic. If the polyps are hyperplastic, the idea is that you can cut them and discard them, not send them to the pathologist, save $200 right there because you have, you know that this is not the kind that can become cancer. If it is the kind that can become cancer, then you would still send it to the pathologist. So that's where some of those tests have been uh, uh, studied and that's where we have used it at Mayo Clinic this is not ready for prime time, but I put it in there because there are studies about it and it is very interesting. Yeah. Yes. What about the, uh, it's been in the news about the equipment So that equipment, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. This, um, what, what she's referring to is there has been a lot of news about some people getting infections from uh, a kind of scope that is used in GI procedure. That, that scope is called an ERCP scope, okay? We would not use that for a colonoscopy. It has a specific indication for getting into the bile duct. For somebody who has stones or who has cancers, we would use that scope that has a side viewing camera to try to get into the bile duct, which we do that procedure here, and we have two of those scopes here, actually three. So this would not apply for a colonoscopy. So if you're getting a colonoscopy, or you're getting a, just a regular upper endoscopy, that has no problem. Now, the problem with that ERCP scope is that it has a side viewing uh, camera and has a channel, and uh, it has a complicated mechanism inside it that makes it difficult to clean. We learned about this several months before this came out into the media, and we have taken actions to try to, uh, before this happened, to try to better clean our scopes. There are guidelines for cleaning the scopes, and what we have done is we have exceeded the guidelines. So if they say clean the scope for 10 minutes, we do 20 minutes. If they say use this brush for, uh, uh, you know, two times, we use this brush 10 times. So we have come up with our, here at Archbold, with our internal uh, guidelines that go beyond the guidelines for cleaning those uh, scopes that come from the manufacturer. And we have not had any of those incidents here. And uh, we hope we will never have it. So that's the answer. Dr. Ojuro has a question. He's our partner. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about uh, genetic counseling for patients that are diagnosed with 
Yeah. So thank you for the question. Uh, um, if somebody has colorectal cancer at a young age, okay, so let's say we go in or somebody has a lot of polyps, you know, somebody in their 40s, less than 50, comes in for whatever reason, symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, or a family history of colon polyps, it is important to get genetic counseling. And the reason being is you, the patient could have one of those familial conditions that I was talking about. One of the most important ones is called Lynch syndrome. So if somebody has several family members that have different kinds of cancers, or somebody who has colon polyps that we do not expect them to have it, there are specific tests that can be done on the actual polyp or the cancer itself to see if the patient has Lynch syndrome or other similar condition. The reason why that is important is if you have that, then we would advise you to have your family members screened differently than if you did not have that condition. So let's say we diagnose you with Lynch syndrome. Then we would ask you, you know, how old are your kids? How many siblings do you have? And probably would recommend screening for those uh, siblings uh, or uh, children at an earlier stage. And this way, we can prevent colon cancer in those children. Plus, as I said, Lynch syndrome can predispose to other kinds of cancers, so there are other, uh, you might need to have other screening tests to have that done. So we do that if we are suspicious at the time of a colonoscopy that a polyp looks suspicious or somebody is too young to be having this, then we can send it for a special kind of analysis. And if that comes back positive, then we can sit down I will usually discuss this with the patients uh, about this risk and recommend screening for all siblings and children at the appropriate age. And a genetic counselor can be helpful in that process, explaining what the disease is and what all the conditions that need to be tested for. Thank you, Dr. Jor. Yes, ma'am. Um, in young children, uh, first let me say I'm not a, a pediatric gastroenterologist, so I have not seen that. So I'll tell you what I studied, okay? And it's usually in somebody who has, those people know that they have this condition because they get cancers at a very, very young age. So it's usually somebody who's had a cancer or a family history of cancer in, in their 20s or 30s, and then they're recommended to have a colonoscopy. And this, that's called FAB, familial adenomatous polyposis. And what we would see if we go in, I have not seen that because they're younger than when I would see them normally. You would see hundreds, if not thousands of polyps. Instead of this normal mucosa that I showed you, the lining of the colon that looks normal, you just see a carpet-like full of polyp. Those patients have a 100% chance of getting colon cancer, at which point we would send them to have the colon taken out. By the time this happens, usually we don't see them. So if there is a family history of somebody who is very young that had this problem, they get diagnosed early. Symptoms, again, like anything else, we, we talked about colon problems, changes in bowel habits, uh, bleeding, constipation, uh, obstruction, things like that are all red flags, especially in somebody who is young. You have a granddaughter, 13 years old. <coughs> she has trouble uh, moving her bowel to the point where <coughs> she's had to have uh, several enemas just to relieve herself got to that point mm -hmm. and you know they they give her medication you know for uh, to soften the stool mm -hmm. but could could a 13 year old develop a large enough polyp to cause blockage or? the answer is yes she could but most likely she doesn't have polyps her mother just had a big polyp when you were yeah, and now that's a different story. I mean, if her mother had polyps, then she needs to be screened 10 years younger than her mom had it. So if her mom, right, so if her mom is in 30s, then she needs to be screened in her 20s. But most commonly in, in children, there are a lot of reasons why children have constipation and why adults have constipation. It's a little bit different in children than in adults, but there are, uh, um, the way I like to think about constipation is like the river and the dam. You have the river, which has river banks, the water in the river, and then you have the dam. And for you to have flow, you need to have an open dam, you need to have river banks, and you need to have good consistency of the water flow, okay? And so the, your colon needs to be working well, your stool needs to be nice and soft, and you need to have a, a functioning rectal muscle that will open up when you, uh, you, you want to go to the bathroom. 
And in a lot of patients who have a constipation and a negative workup, there are medical problems that can cause constipation, low thyroid hormone, calcium problems, things like that, which we will test for among those patients. But if that comes back normal, then we need to start looking, okay, maybe their colon is not working well, maybe they're on pain medications or other medications that cause the colon not to function, maybe they're not opening their rectal muscles like they're supposed to, and so even though if the stool is soft, they're not having a good bowel movement. So there are a lot of things to be tested for, and you know, if she has not seen a gastroenterologist, she should see a gastroenterologist, and if she's only 13, unfortunately, I cannot help her. But you know, wait maybe four or five years for me. <laughs> Any other questions? Was the food good? Yes. Was it colon healthy? <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions, um, feel, feel free to come up and, and I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and uh, if you would like to come and see us, we are available at any time, okay? Thank you very much.